So this is the last conversation from the series about reopening Christianity. We've been asking some pretty pointed questions, and today is the question of all questions. Is Jesus your Savior, or is Jesus your Savior and Lord? All right? Because there's a big difference between those two. In fact, you could say that Christianity all comes down to the difference between if you're saved or, or if you're just saved or if Jesus is Lord. And, you know, the pandemic revealed some powerful uh, problems in, in our Christianity. A lot of churches weren't able to survive the pandemic, which would indicate that they weren't in line with the power source available to them. And I don't mean that in any finger pointing way. I don't at all. I'm trying to say you had a problem, but you just feel like the church of Jesus Christ could overcome anything. And sometimes we drift, we get lost, we aren't filled with the Holy Spirit and we end up being empty and not able to uh, rise to the occasion. I think all of us had to, to reorient our lives a little bit, okay? And so um, I'd like to suggest that when you're a Christian, you're the recipient of grace, you have the power and presence of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ inside of you. You are a force to be reckoned with. Okay? Right now, we need money for the Community Hope Center to buy a hotel that would enable us to take care of a lot of families. And the price tag is so huge, we don't walk away, but we're, wa we're not walking away. We're walking into the presence of the Lord and say, Lord, we need a $2 million down payment. So we want you to guide us. We, instead of just saying, oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? We feel like this could be the right move for us. So, Lord, we want to pitch it out before you. And, and you know, coming out of COVID soon, we, we hopefully got some new habits, some new routines. I ended up getting a prayer life that was very important to me. And, and I think a great pruning took place at COVID. And John 15, 2, it says, every branch that bears fruit, Jesus prunes, so it will be more fruitful. Now, when I was a little boy, I took care of the yard, and I'm talking, you know, elementary school. One time I went out and cut down all the bushes. I just creamed all the rose bushes, and we got in a lot of trouble, you know. Um, one, I had this clippers, and I clip this one tree as far as you could reach, you know? So it looked like a horrible tree. The next year it produced tangerines. We didn't know it was a tangerine tree. But Mr. Clippers here got involved and the tree actually, it, it, it actually started to produce as it was, was, its purpose was to produce, okay? And, and you have a purpose to glorify God. You have a purpose to share his love. You have a purpose to, to experience the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so um, how does that happen? Well, in the early church, there was a question. Is Jesus your Lord? They didn't say, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? If they do, they say, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? What came first, Savior and Lord? No, Lord and Savior. Lord is who he is, saving is what he does. Listen to this. It's when you consent to his lordship in your life that he saves you. What a powerful statement. It's when Jesus is Lord that all the salvation energy gets released into your life. That's why when you get busy with the ministry, you see a lot of supernatural activity. You know, you don't wait for the supernatural activity to get busy. You get busy and then he shows up. Okay. Um, Jesus saves is not the same thing as Jesus is Lord. Jesus saves. Uh, he's called Savior 16 times in the New Testament, 420 times is he called Lord. Uh, Savior occurs 37 times in the entire Bible, Lord 7,000 times. So you get the idea that he is Lord. And, and um, 
You know, Lord doesn't sell so, excuse me. Yeah, Lord does not sell so well. I remember I, had, I was at my second church. It was a thousand member church. It was a big deal. And this woman quit the church. I go, why are you quitting the church? Because you called Jesus Lord. And I, I was confused. <clears throat> I, I, am I missing something in this conversation? I, I, you, you mean you have a problem with Jesus being Lord and that's why you're quitting the church? You have to let that person go. You can't even argue with them. Okay? Um, the Old Testament prophets, they did not do well in terms of, you know, being popular because Jesus was God, was Lord God, and uh, that's where you started. You didn't infiltrate God with Baal and the Ashtara poles and the, the, you know, whatever cultural sin was out there. Jesus was Lord. That's the way it was. They all got killed because it wasn't popular. And guess what? Um, we have a problem in America. Okay, we like to collect the blessings and the benefits of Jesus being our Savior. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of benefits, okay? Um, and, and we actually preach a gospel that is about the benefits of belonging to Jesus Christ. And, you know, we, we kind of make fun of, you know, the Old Testament having idols until one day, you know, idols obviously, they're not part of our culture until it's defined as an idol is an object of excessive devotion. And suddenly, guess what? You have idols. What are you excessively devoted to? What are you most in love with? Who, what is, has the throne on your heart? Now, you could argue that the American dream is the American Christian's problem, okay? We have access to affluence and you're invited to go after it. It's in the Constitution, you know? You have the right to, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we're all after that one, right? Um, the problem is when we have freedom to pursue our goals, we have it backwards because it's all about me, my ability, my goals, my affluence. By the way, speaking of affluence, Deuteronomy 8:18, 8, it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. You like to think, well, wasn't I? No, you aren't. God gave you the ability, the power to make wealth, and now he wants 10% of it. And that's a great way for you to check your greed, to make sure he's the Lord, to do your tithing. And, you know, when you don't make much, it's easy to tithe. But then when you make more, suddenly, ouch, it becomes harder to tithe. You know, and, and um, you know, when I made $12,000 a year, I gave $1,200. Easy to do. Get made $40,000 a year, it's harder to give $4,000. But then when you get up into, the, you know, the six digits, you're like, oh, my goodness. And that's when the Lord says, you, obey me. And, and guess what? That's making sure that he's Lord and Savior. Um, you know, a lot of times we think, wasn't that a smooth move I did? No, that was God empowering you. You know, I, I, I did a funeral the other day, and <clears throat> I was so tired, and I was discombobulated, and the person didn't give me very much information about their loved one. And so I was going into this not feeling strong. And so I prayed, Lord, would you empower me? And I gave one of the best funeral messages that I have, can, and can remember. And, you know, and when I was done, I mean, I made jokes that I didn't plan on that were appropriate for a funeral. I mean, I, 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 it was just incredible what happened. I asked for help. He showed up, okay? Now, I could have walked away and go, whew, you know, I'm pretty good at this. No way. I went in there. Hurting, came out victorious. What was the only difference? Lord, please, oh, please help me. Okay? That's the way you got to go forward in life. And, and I want you to know the American dream, it, it's the priorities are wrong. It's all about me acquiring. Okay? It, um, it's about me accomplishing. It's about me enjoying. And, and uh, by the way, you don't accomplish anything. Jesus says in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
Now he's probably talking about ministry and I'm a ministry guy and you're ministry people. And don't we want to roll up our sleeve and make a contribution to the kingdom of God? The best way to make a contribution to the kingdom of God is say, Lord, use me. And then he starts moving in your head, connecting you to people, putting something on your heart. You pray over it. You use your own finances to get things started with it. You network with other people. And the next thing you know, a ministry is underway. And you get to see God moving powerfully through you. That's how ministry is supposed to happen. You know, we can sit in the boardroom and we see people that need to be touched by God. And we put a strategic plan together and we raise enough funds and we go for it. And, and you're probably going to have an okay ministry experience. But when you need something and it's a big ticket item and, and God's required, now you're talking about a completely different, powerful moment in the kingdom of God. And, and the gospel message is to make much about God, not make much about ourselves. Okay. A God actually delights in our inability when situations are too big for us. And think about your own life right now. What's too big for you? Uh, let's say you want to do a ministry. Let's say you want to see your grandchildren saved. Let's say, you know, you, you want to figure out how to, you know, fund an outreach. Let's, I don't know what your ministry might be. But if it's too big for you, you're in a good spot because now you're in dependence upon him. Okay, very, very important. This is what it means to have Jesus as Lord because you're pursuing his agenda, not your own. When he's your savior, it's about my prosperity, my comfort, and I'm all excited about what God does for me. And, and the sadness of Christianity in America right now is we've kind of crafted a, a Jesus who doesn't mind our materialism, who doesn't get in the way of our comforts, who, you know, who loves us just the way we are. And people will say that Jesus loves me just the way I am. And I go, yes, and he loves you too much to leave you that way. Okay. He's got an agenda for your life. And, and we, we have a Christianity that nothing's required of you. Nobody even tithes anymore. Nobody gets involved in ministry. Do you have a prayer life and a Bible devotions? You know, you don't need any of that stuff because you're covered by grace. That's the comments that get made. But when you do get into the Bible and you do tithe and you do go to church and you do put yourself out for the ministry, that's when you see amazing Christianity. Um, you know, what's kind of interesting is... Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he wrote the book, The Call to Discipleship. And he makes this powerful statement. So you go get that phone, okay? And so, um, when God calls a man, he bids him come and die. Okay? And, you know, when you're a young man, it's, ooh, that's, you know, that means something. I'm giving my life to the call of Jesus Christ. It's a powerful moment, okay? But then you have kids and a wife. That's why Paul says don't have a wife, okay? Because now you got to worry about her, okay? You single guys, you don't have to worry about her. And I know you're longing to have her, but guess what? You know, Paul says better that you can do more ministry without having a partner. What a joy to have a partner like you guys are a team. And that's amazing to see how that works, okay? A team, that's just beautiful to see, Okay? Um, when Jesus is Lord, he calls the shots in your life. And, and following Jesus isn't easy, okay? You got forgiveness issues. You have to forgive somebody. It's not an option. Ouch. And when you don't forgive, the Lord kind of has this thorn bush around you, and you're not able to ever be comfortable because you've got something between you and him. He wants you to forgive that person. Um, he wants you to share your faith. So easy not to share our faith. Every time I don't share my faith when I have an opportunity, oh, I feel so horrible afterwards. I got scared. I was, didn't want to be inconvenienced. I, I was too selfish to see the opportunity. I don't know what the argument is, the excuse is, but afterwards, you missed a God moment for him to show up. Okay, and, and by the way, when I say he calls the shots, remember in Galatians 2, 
20, it says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. When Jesus is Lord, he's living through you. And the good thing is, he's got blessings in mind for you. He's answering prayers. He's anticipating your needs. He has supernatural encounters with you. This is what happens when Jesus is Lord. When you're just saved, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. And there's no interaction of the kingdom of God in your life. There's no experience of the presence of God in your life. And if there is, it's all about, I had a warm, fuzzy feeling. And, and it's not about your warm, fuzzy feeling. It's about somebody else meeting Jesus because of your faith. All right? And, and, and you know, we live in a selfie world. And, um, you know, my daughter loves to take selfies, you know, <laughs> all the time, selfies, right? So one time I found this little clip that says, anybody who takes selfies is selfish. <laughs> you know, so I showed it to her, curbed a few of the selfies, okay? Um, we're not supposed to be taking selfies of ourselves. We're supposed to be glorifying God. We're supposed to be exalting God. We're supposed to be switching our gaze off of me and onto God. In fact, in Hebrews 12, it says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher, perfecter of your faith. That's who you're supposed to be looking at. That's what it means to have Jesus as Lord. Jesus as Savior, is your eyes on me, and here's what I need. Jesus as Lord, Father, what do you want from me? See the difference, okay? It's a difference of focus. And so I guess the first question I want to ask you, are you saved and your life is still under old management or is Jesus Lord and he's directing the new you okay are you still in charge or is he infringing on you I, I have a friend and and every time you know they say oh the Holy Spirit told me this and it's exactly what they want to do I'm like well how do you know that's the Holy Spirit it just sounds like what you want to do that that's not the Holy Spirit that's maybe you getting a warm fuzzy because you had a spiritual thought, but the Holy Spirit is, is the one who leads us out of the comfort zone, who brings us into to difficult moments, who requires forgiveness and surrender. Who, who, it's, it's a completely different lifestyle when you're under the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And so are you saved and enjoying all the blessings or is Jesus Lord and releasing blessings through you. How exciting to get to heaven and find out you made a contribution to heaven. How embarrassing it'll be to get to heaven and realize I didn't do anything of significance except get saved. All right? I'm trying to save you embarrassment when you get to heaven, okay? And maybe what that means is you and I have to put a prayer list together and just start praying people into heaven. Maybe that means you have, to, you have a conversation with someone in your life who's not walking with Jesus and say, you know, I'm a churchgoer and you mean a lot to me and, you know, I'm getting old and I'm curious, do you have any spiritual thoughts? Initiate the spiritual conversation and then plan on coming back to it over the next few times you see this person. Spiritually invest in somebody. John Wesley says nobody gets to go to heaven alone. You have to bring somebody. Okay, is anybody going to be there because of our faith? And, and friends, believe it or not, you've been called. There's this powerful moment in 1 Kings where <clears throat> Elijah comes up to Elisha. That's a tongue twister, okay? And Elisha has 12 pairs of oxen plowing the field, and he's driving the 12th one, so, you know, he's, he's this insinuates affluence and Elisha comes up, Elijah comes up puts his mantle on Elisha and so he comes up to a guy who's doing well in life puts his mantle on him and that means you've been called by God now he can say yes or he can say no Elisha okay um Elijah was the most powerful, faith-filled prophet of the day. He brought down fire from heaven, not just once, a couple other times, not to mention a whole bunch of other miracles, raising the dead, all kinds of incredible stuff. He went to heaven in a chariot of fire, all right? 
So this is a serious guy. And, and Elijah was basically offering Elisha a job. <laughs> Would you like to work with the Almighty God? And um, this was a calling. This was an invitation. And, and <clears throat> invitations like this don't come around too often. I remember one time I was in between jobs and somebody offered me a million dollar salary a year to go into their business. Okay. You know, I like, I, I would like to have a million dollar salary. Okay. And, and my wife, she, she ruined everything. She goes, oh boy, Satan's real clever, isn't he? He knows just how to come to you, doesn't he? You know, and I'm sitting there counting my million dollars and she's, you know, discounting the million dollars. Going, hey boy, you belong to Jesus. You're supposed to be in the ministry. You get your finances from him. You get your purpose in life from him. Don't get your eyes off on, you know, an easy lifestyle. That's not what you're called to do. And, and, and here's the lie, Shah. He burns his 12 plows. And you're thinking, wow, <clears throat> you know, why would you burn your 12 plows? I mean, what's going on here? Wasn't it be more practical to leave the plows to the family so somebody else could make the money for the family and, you know, plow the fields? And he burns the plows and uses it, kills the oxen to have a feast feeds everybody in town, and then leaves and goes to follow Elijah. Why did he do that? <clears throat> because a response is necessary, all right? And the response is this. Um, it's more important that I make a statement to God than be practical. I need to make a statement that I'm not willing to turn back to my old lifestyle. You know, when the Romans arrived in Britain, uh, that everybody got up the cliffs of Dover and they were all ready to march into Britain. And, uh, you know, the leader said, turn around. And they turned around and all their ships were on fire. There was no retreat. <laughs> okay. We won't be going home the conventional way. And, and what a statement. And that's why Jesus says, you know, you got to separate from this world. Man, I had the best tennis player, friend, and, and, I had to cut him off because he was a hindrance to my ministry. I had girlfriends that I really liked. I had to cut them off. They were hindrances to my ministry. Sometimes you have to separate from things you really like because you are trying to follow Jesus Christ. And that's why Elisha burned the equipment. All right. And so how many of us, we have the same invitation that the rich young ruler does. You know, Jesus, he, he knows how to come alongside and let's just say your problem is affluence. And he goes, give it to the poor. Your problem, um, boy, which one do I choose, okay? You know? He knows how to come exactly to each one of us with our unique situations and saying, this is what I want from you, but from you I want something different and from you something still different. And from you, he comes to where we're weak to say, I want where you're struggling. Give that to me because I'm going to be your source of joy, of supply, of happiness, of purpose, of empowerment, okay? He knows what we need. He knows what we struggle with. And, and the problem is with the rich young ruler, Jesus says, follow me, and he was unwilling to do it. And I think we talked about this before. You know, did he ever look back longingly and hear about all the miraculous stuff going on and, and go, wow, what did I miss out on? I'm, I'm stuck with my stuff. And, and I, I should have I followed Jesus where the miracles are underway and the kingdom of God is, is now in, in place. And, and how many of us do we have one foot holding back and one foot in the, the, our faith? Now I know all of us, we're all serious Christians, two feet in, okay? I'm talking about the people at the other church, okay? <laughs> and we'd like to talk about the people of the other church, but don't we do that a little bit? Don't we have our escape clause. And you know, you see it in your prayer life. Lord, I want to pray for this. If it's your will. Well, we know that it's his will. Okay. And if it's your will is to give him the out in case he doesn't do it. So I'm not coming in saying, Lord, I'm not leaving this prayer until you, uh, you give me the assurance that you're going to show up. That's the kind of person you want praying for you. 
You know, I met with a man this morning and he, you know, he had this problem with uh, a tenant that wouldn't leave. And, and he, cause he's got this, uh, this, um, <laughs> a woman from, I think the Dominican Republic. She says, I'm going to pray for you. And this problem that he had for five months, the woman prays one time, tenant leaves immediately. I said, hey, can I have that woman's phone number? Okay. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to be the kind of person that can call down power from heaven? You can be. You're supposed to be. That's an invitation from you. But if it's your will, well, now I understand what we're saying is maybe God has a different will than what we're praying for here. I, I understand that. But how often do we tack that on just to give God an out clause? Better not to give him an out clause. Better to swing it out and deal with it. And if he tells you no, then you're okay. But until he does, I'm praying for it to happen. All right? By the way, Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah. He asked, you know, let me have a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah says, boy, you're asking a hard thing. If you see me go up in the fire of your chariot, then you get it. He saw him go up. Boom. Parts the Jordan River. First off, okay. How's that? You pick up the mantle, boom. Part the river as you're on your way home. Um, yeah, it's a whole different kind of presence of God within him because God was his Lord. And are you stepping in? like this. You know, I remember one time I was in seminary and I came across Luke 9, 23, where it says, you know, anyone who wishes to follow me must deny himself daily, pick up his cross and follow me. The daily part, it's only in Luke. Believe me, I searched. I tried to erase it. It's in Luke. And, and, it's daunting. It's scary. But can we not trust this God who has your goodness in mind, who knows what's better for you than what you think is best for yourself, who has eternity waiting, put his Holy Spirit inside of you, forgives you all the time, never st stops investing in you? Why would we want to hold back from this God? Hmm? What is there better than this God moving to you and moving through you. And so it all comes back to who are you in love with? What are you willing to give your life to? You know, we're all in a stage in life where we want to leave a legacy. You know, it's going to be my birthday this month. I'm going to be 60 years old. Okay. Uh, it's May 26, just in case you were wondering, you know, still have time to get a present. And um, I'm thinking of my legacy. And don't you get to the end of your life and say, what did I contribute? What of significance eternally took place in my life? You know, what did I allow God to accomplish through me? And, and there's nothing that you will accomplish greater than investing in the next generation with Jesus Christ. Nothing. How do we do that? You have a prayer list. You initiate conversations. You give to ministries that are reaching out to the next generation. You have a personal relationship with God that flows out of you to other people. Okay? It's not, you know, we like to think of, you know, some big corporate sign that we could make. No, it's his corporate sign, which is the Holy Spirit within you that does all the magic. All right? Make sense? And by the way, I think this is amazing. You know, Elisha, when his final miracle happened, after he was dead, some marauders were coming into town when they were burying somebody else, and they saw the marauders coming, and they tossed this guy into Elisha's grave, and the guy immediately rose from the dead. <laughs> okay? Think about this legacy that you have. It outlasts your life. What you invest in heaven, what you give over to the Lord, he'll keep moving even though you've moved on to heaven. And how fun would it be to be in heaven and watching God still answering your prayers here on earth? 
Wouldn't that just be the most fantastic experience? You know, that you and everything you invested in is still having spiritual repercussions. Well, I'm talking about the miracles and, you know, I'm a miracle guy. I love miracles. I believe in miracles. I like miracles. But you never want to be a miracle chaser. It's very important. You pursue the Lord and he decides when the miracles are going to happen. And the greatest miracle that can happen is the one unseen in somebody's heart. I could heal your leg or your tooth, <laughs> okay? I could, oh, where do we start, okay? But you're going to die in a few, quite a few decades from now, okay? You know, when you get to 120. I talked to this old, frail person the other day. I go, how long are you living? 120, you know, like, they're already God. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, wow. That's, that's amazing. So here's the deal. The miracle of miracles is when Jesus becomes your Lord and you're following his directives and he starts showing up in people's lives because of you. Starts extending his reach through you. His words come out of your mouth. His heart's beating inside of you and it gets released on the people that cross your path. That's what Christianity is about. You didn't get saved so that you can wait for the bus to heaven to come. Jesus is Lord and saving is what he does. You got to get that question answered. And so I think the final, the final push is this. Is he your Lord? Or have we infiltrated him into our lives is he part of the options that we choose? Does he get to determine your finances, get to determine your thought life, get to determine your conversations, get to determine the way you behave, get to determine what you are dreaming about, okay? Because when you let them all the way in is when you experience all the many amazing moments that God has available for you. Well, I want you to do amazing things for Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you're going to get to heaven. Praise God. But you're going to be walking around with your hands in your pocket. Okay? No one else is here because of me. And, and what God could have done and would have done through you. And, you know, since it's a bunch of us senior saints around here, I'm about to be one of you, okay, in a few weeks. May 26, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Um, think of all the decades that you've walked with Jesus all the relationship that you have with Jesus you might like to think well I'm not in the game anymore oh contrary you're in the game you're closer to him you know him better you hear his voice um, you probably could have an even greater impact by just following the directives of the Lord. Speak to this person. Pray over this so-and-so. Invest in this situation. All right, may the Lord Jesus put his Holy Spirit afresh upon us. Lord, may we move from being saved to allowing you to be the Lord. Thy will, not my will, as Jesus said. It's in his name we pray, amen. amen. In today's fast moving world, smartphones are integrated into our lives. We bank and shop on our smartphones and many of us want to give with them too. Giving to the church with a text message is fast, easy and versatile. With Give Plus Text, you can make a weekly offering or respond to a special appeal in just seconds. To give, you enter the church's 10 digit Give Plus Text number and the amount you wish to donate. Then send your text. The first time you contribute with Give Plus Text, you'll receive a secure registration link. Click the link to go to our secure website where you'll enter your contact and payment information. Tap Process when you're done. After you've completed your registration, 
A text reply will verify that your gift has been received. We'll also email your receipt. For future giving, you simply send a text with the amount you wish to give, and it will process automatically. You can also choose to make your gift recurring. Gift Plus Text is that easy. Register, give, repeat. Call or visit the church office to ask about Give Plus Text and the other electronic giving options we offer.